it's worth looking ahead um, so you're not a bit overwhelmed. <clears throat> All right, this is the very simplest alkene. Um, this is ethene, two carbons. Alkane, the functional group alkene, is typically shown as a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, the geometry here is, as you can see as this thing rotates around, this is planar, and these bond angles are 120 degrees. We construct the carbon-carbon uh, double bond, as we said before, using 1s and 2p orbitals. So we have uh, three orbitals we're using. We will make a sigma network with three bonds. A valence shell electron pair repulsion predicts this should be trigonal and planar. And in fact, it is. This is our sigma network. Uh, all the bonds are 120 degrees. Now we know that carbon, um, hybridized carbon, is going to have 1s and 3p orbitals. So we have a p orbital left over on each of these carbons. These um, show up um, on each carbon, and they look something like this. When these um, orbitals align with each other, just like I've shown, um, they can overlap. And as they overlap, they form a continuous electron cloud that's above and below the plane of the sigma network. If you cut this away, goes. And you can see here's our sigma network. And again, we have the electron level up and the lone down. Um, this is a very rich source of electrons. We've talked about that. When we say we have a carbon-carbon double bond, one bond is our sigma bond here. And the second bond we're referring to as this pi bond, where we have these p orbitals overlap to form this arrangement of electron density above and below the plane. Any questions? <clears throat> now, when, when I described the basic bonding here, I said that these orbitals overlap because they are parallel to each other. That has an interesting consequence. Because they must be parallel, <clears throat> Unlike most simple sigma bonds, if you rotate around here, something like this, so that we had this arrangement, our p orbitals would no longer align, and therefore they would not overlap. So basically what happens here is that you lose the second bond. This requires lots of energy. This overlap generates a lot of energy. So under normal conditions, the uh, geometry around the carbon-carbon double bond does not rotate. Now that means that we can have two isomeric alkenes that might look something like this. Here we have our carbon-carbon double bond in the middle. I have a methyl group up here and down here. Um, compare that with this one, where we have two methyl groups going up or down. Um, this is referred to as trans geometry. Trans, as we've seen with cycloalkanes, simply means they are on opposite sides. Here they're on opposite sides of our double bond. Um, this is cis on the same side of our double bond. Typically, Cis and trans isomers will not convert. Now I say typically because they actually do. You can heat up, oh say the cis isomer here, um, put enough energy into it. If you put enough energy in, it will go to the trans isomer. Why the trans? Because this is geometrically more stable. Here the methyl groups are bumping into each other, and here they're not. Another very notable example is fission itself. 
um, envision the uh, retinal owl in the back of your retina is actually a cis double bond isomer. Um, the way that vision works is that retinal will absorb a photon of light. The electrons go to an excited state. When they do, you can break this double bond easily, and it rotates from the cis to the trans isomer. That is the chemistry, the ultimate chemistry of vision. But typically, we're going to say that rotation around a double bond does not work. Any questions? Well, let's just look at, OK, so this is, again, another example of stereoisomers. Let's just look at what we know about alkenes, <coughs> cycloalkenes, alkanes, and now alkenes. We know that the general formula for an alkane was CnH2n plus 2. So that means that if we had two carbons, we would expect six hydrogens. If we have 12 carbons, we would expect 26 hydrogens. So that's just for a simple alkane. Next, we looked at cycloalkanes. In a cycloalkane, we said our general formula was CnH2n, so two less hydrogens. Again, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, five carbons, 10 hydrogens. For every ring, we lose two hydrogens in our compound. Well, alkenes are just like cycloalkanes. Again, the general formula is CnH2n, and we've lost two hydrogens. It's obvious to see we've lost them here on our carbon-carbon double bond. This gives rise to a notion called degree of unsaturation. Now, this is something that's useful analytically. It's also going to be very useful um, next semester when we do spectroscopy. Um, we're going to be able to take the basic formula, and from the basic formula, we fit for a hydrocarbon, we can tell how many double bonds or rings total there are in a compound. And that's useful if you're trying to build a structure from little bits of data. Let's see how this works. Here we have two compounds. Calculate the degrees of unsaturation in both of them. Well, the first thing you want to do is simply add up the carbons and hydrogens. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And we have 12 hydrogens. <clears throat> if this had been an alkane with six carbons, we would expect 14 hydrogens, wouldn't we? If we're missing two, we have one degree of unsaturation. Another way to look at it, if you just look at the compound here, we have one double bond, one degree of unsaturation. Could you go back one slide about the little bubble? Yeah. If it was six carbons, it would have 14 hydrogens. <clears throat> We're missing, we only have 12. We're missing two. That's one degree of unsaturation. Let's do the next one. Add up the number of carbons. If this was a simple hydrocarbon, how many hydrogens would it have? Well, this guy has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten carbons? Yeah. Yeah. And it only has 16 hydrogens. If we had an alkane that was C10, 
it would have 22 hydrogens. So we are missing 22 minus 16. That's six hydrogens, right? We're missing six. That's three degrees of unsaturation. Now again, a very simple way to do this in your head is just to look at the compound and say, we have two double bonds and we have a ring. That's three degrees of unsaturation. Now we can actually make degrees of unsaturation fun. Look at this compound. How many carbons? Well, we have six, seven. Seven times two is 14, plus two more is 16, right? This is C7H12, so we have two degrees of unsaturation. Now, we've been able to look at the molecule and very quickly identify how many to use there were simply based on the structure. Number of double bonds, number of rings. If we have two degrees of unsaturation, where are they? Well, there are actually two rings here. This is called a bicyclic compound. Now, it's important that you be able to look at something like this and see that there are two rings. Uh, there's a simple rule, a simple method that you can do to, to do this. What you do is you start somewhere, anywhere, and you complete a ring of carbon atoms. So you start anywhere, you complete a ring. Then you look and you see what you have left. You start at one of the places that's left, follow a new path, until you get back to where you started. So here, first thing we want to do is just, oh, we'll start somewhere here, and let's identify a ring. I did the six-member ring boat on the bottom. All right? Now we have this left over, don't we? So that's one additional path. We're going to start here, go up, and then down. And now we have two rings in the compound. So you start anywhere, you make a ring. You could have gone around here and up, doesn't matter. Then you look and see what's left. Start on your parent ring and go back to We will see examples of bicyclic, tricyclic, and polycyclic compounds. Again, this is what makes it all fun. Any questions? This is very simple. Here's a methylcyclohexane. This has six, seven carbons. Um, it would be expected to have 14. Or it has 14, it should have 16, therefore we have one degree of unsaturation. And this is obviously our ring. So it doesn't matter if it's branch or whatever. Now, as we know, carbon compounds can get very interesting. Um, we can put chemical atoms in there, of halogens nitrogen, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are rules that allow you to take those and calculate degrees of unsaturation as well. The simplest, well, I guess the real simplest, is a halogen. If you have a halogen, you just pretend it's a hydrogen. That's all. Oxygen is also very simple. If you have an oxygen, all you do is ignore it. Just pretend it's not there. Why does that work? Because oxygen is divalent. 
So it just falls out of the equation altogether. Let's see how this works. <clears throat> Here we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. We have 10 hydrogens. And we have a single oxygen. Well, ignore the oxygen. So we're looking at C5H10. It should be C5H12. Therefore, this is one degree of unsaturation. Again, it makes sense. This is the ring. Let's do it again. This is an alcohol, isn't it? Here we have five carbons and an OH. This gives us C5H10O. Also, they're isomers, aren't they? Again, we should have 12 hydrogens. We simply ignore the oxygen. We need two more hydrogens. Therefore, this has one degree of unsaturation. Any questions? The only one that really can make you crazy is nitrogen. Nitrogen is trivalent. <clears throat> because it's trivalent, we can't just ignore it. Um, and it's going to eat up one additional hydrogen in our formula. All right? So the rule here is that we're going to subtract one hydrogen for every nitrogen. So again, we're just going to look at the carbons. But we're going to subtract this hydrogen that's sitting up here on our nitrogen. For this first one, we have C5, um, H10, 11, and a nitrogen. We pretend that the nitrogen isn't there, and we take its hydrogen away, too. Basically, we just made it into like an oxygen, didn't we? So we have C5H10. We should have 12, one degree of unsaturation. And that's what you'd expect. If you look at it, you see one ring. Um, I have a question. Is there a um, hydrogen alive that should be 12 there, or no? Sorry? No, there's 11. 11. 2, 4, 6, so 8, 10, 11. Because nitrogen is trivalent. Uh -huh. This guy is an amine. We have five carbons. <clears throat> so we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11 hydrogens. So this is C5. H11, N. Again, they're isomeric. So we just get rid of our nitrogen, and we get rid of one hydrogen along with it. So again, this looks like it's C5H10. If you're at C5H10, <clears throat> you're missing two hydrogens, and we have one DU. Once again, just look at it. There's one ring, one DU. Any question? See, it can be fun. Um, on the exam, of course, they're a little more interesting than these. This is a typical exam question. How many degrees of unsaturation do we have here? I will pause. Now, the stupid way to do this, sorry, <laughs> is to sit there and count the carbons and hydrogens. You can't do that on the exam. You have way too much else to do. So you just want to look at it and say, how many rings, how many double bonds do we have? Um, if you sat there and you did add all this up, you would get C25H40O. 
Now, if we had four, uh, 25 carbons in a simple hydrocarbon, we would expect 52 hydrogens. We're going to ignore the oxygen, so it's gone. So we're missing 12 hydrogens or 6 degrees of unsaturation. Now we can do this in our head, just like this. Count the rings. One, two, three, four. Count the double bonds. One, two. Six degrees of unsaturation. Any questions? Yeah. I just want to clarify. Okay, so you can count the degrees of unsaturation by counting the number of rings and yeah. adding it to the number of. That's it. That's as simple as it can get, right? Or you can do it the long way and add it all up. Four rings, two double bonds, six degrees of unsaturation. Well, that's one that was on the test. The other one that was on the test was this. Yes, that really is a carbon compound. This is called cubane. Yes, it really is a cube. Now, there are two ways that we can do this, right? We can simply look at cubane and come up with the number of um, rings. No double bonds, just the number of rings. Or we can add up carbons and hydrogens. Here it's probably simpler just to add up carbons and hydrogens, isn't it? It's a cube, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. How many hydrogens? Every carbon has one hydrogen. So this is C8H8. Now, if we had eight carbons, we would expect 18 hydrogens, wouldn't we? It is, uh, is eight, so that's 16 plus two, 18. We only have eight, so we are missing Five hydrogens, I'm sorry, ten hydrogens, five degrees of unsaturation. Now, just for fun, let's use our rule and trace out the individual rings. We know the answer, there are going to be five of them. Right? So we'll start somewhere and just connect dots together. That works. Now, we want to start somewhere on our blue rectangle and connect more dots till we get back to our blue rectangle. That works. <coughs> Do the same thing. Now we have to connect our green and our red we can do it there, or we can do it here. How many rings do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Any questions? Once again, degrees of unsaturation will become very useful to you when we're doing spectroscopy. You'll be given an unknown compound. You'll typically be given a molecular formula. First thing you do is figure out how many rings and double bonds or triple bonds there are. Triple bonds work the same way. Um, we'll do those in, that is chapter 9, I believe. Um, chapter 9 is alkynes. We'll do triple bonds, uh, but they just count as two degrees of unsaturation each. All right. We're done.
doing a new functional group, the first thing we always do is simple nomenclature. <clears throat> let's look at this alkene, and let's figure out what we're going to call it. First thing you do is you say, well, it is an alkene. We're going to show that using the suffix E and E in the name. So that's rule one. Now, rule number two. Oh, here we have five carbons. That's our longest chain. It's an alkene, so we're going to call this a pentene. <clears throat> Again, we're numbering the chain. We want to find the longest chain that contains the alkene. All right? That's what we the, the rule is. Doesn't matter if there's more carbons going up this way. Your parent chain here must contain the alkene. The longest one here, five carbons, that makes this a pentene. Rule number two, once we decide on our parent, we have to number it. The rule is we want to give the first carbon of the double bond the lowest possible number. So the parent must contain the alkene, and you must give it the lowest possible number. That means that this is going to be carbon one, and we're going to go down here to five. Next, we're going to look and we're going to see side chains. Oh, and our name. Let's go back here. Our double bond here starts at carbon number one. We have to show that. So this is going to be a one in team. All right, next, we have an ethyl group sticking up here. <coughs> We're going to look at where the ethyl group is attached. We're going to name it in the usual fashion. If we just happen to have more than one double bond, we would call it a diene or a triene or whatever, and we would stick in numbers to show where all the double bonds are. We don't. We only have one in this case. We also have an ethyl group here attached to carbon two. So this is 2-ethyl, 1-N2. Any questions? Well, let's go ahead and work some examples. Then. Here's another one. Look at this guy and come up with a name. First thing you want to do is find the longest chain that contains the double bond, right? <clears throat> we have a nice long chain here. We want to give our double bond the lowest possible number. Therefore, we're going to start numbering down here, making the first carbon of our double bond carbon number two. Next, we're going to look and see substituents. We have two methyl groups here on carbon 6. So, we have seven carbons. We have a double bond here at carbon 3. Start off with a 3 heptene. We have two methyl groups out here at carbon 6. Therefore, this is a 6,6-dimethyl-3-heptene. Any questions? 
Now note, we did not start numbering down here, did we? If this were just an alkane, this would be carbon 1, because that would give us a 2,2. Two. But it's an alkene, so we must give the alkene the lowest possible number. All right, just like we have cycloalkanes, we can also have, oh, oh, I forgot. We have stereochemistry here, too, don't we? We have stereochemistry to deal with. <clears throat> Look at our double bond and see the carbons that are attached. This and this are on opposite sides of our double bond, aren't they? Therefore, we must indicate that stereochemistry as trans. The full name would be trans-6,6-dimethyl-3-heptene. All right, cycloalkene. When you're doing with a, dealing with a cycloalkane, the thing to remember um, is numbering. The rule is we have to start at one of the double bonds. We're going to let one of the carbons of one of the double bonds be carbon number one. Carbon two will then be the other one. So you always proceed through the double bond. So you start at one carbon, proceed through. Now if you have more than one double bond, obviously you want to go to the lowest number, first point of difference, and blah, blah, blah. But carbons one and two in a cycloalkene must be the double bond. So for this guy, we can let this be carbon number one. We must proceed through the double bond. So this is one, two. That makes this carbon three. And our next double bond would start here at carbon number four. This is therefore going to be a diene, isn't it? The diene. The double bonds are going to be located at carbons 1 and 4. So what will be a 1,4 cyclohexadiene? We have no substituents. So we're dealing with a cyclohexadiene. We have to indicate where the double bonds are. They're at carbon 1 and 4. Any questions? Now, as you can imagine, this can get fun, cute, interesting. Let's look at this one. Six-membered ring. We have three methyls attached, and we have a double bond. You say to yourself, I know that carbons one and two must be the alkene carbons. We're going to number these, however, to try to give us our lowest number sequence at the first point of difference, right? If we let this be carbon number one, this is two, then we would have two methyls here in carbon three, right? If we let this be carbon one, this must be two, we only have one methyl in carbon-3. Therefore, this is the best number sequence because it gives us uh, a 3,3,6 three, for our methyl groups. If we did it the other way around, it would be a 3,6,6. 3,3,6 three, six, six. Three, three, six is better than 3,6,6. Six, six. All right, our name. This is going to be a cyclohexene, isn't it? 
<clears throat> we don't need to number where the double bond is because we know it's going to be carbons 1 and 2. All we have to do is say it's a cyclohexene with these three methyl groups. So our parent is cyclohexene. We have methyl groups at carbons 3, 3, and 6. Three of them. 366 trimethyl cyclohexene. It wouldn't be incorrect if you use the number, would it? If you use the other number? No, no. If you include the one cyclohexene, uh, it would be. Would be incorrect? Yeah. Because by definition, they must be carbons one and two. Uh, do we need to say that this is a cis? Double bond. Is it going to have RNS there? Hmm? Are we going to have RNS configuration for cyclo? No, we'll come to that in just a minute. <laughs> this is a Carl Center, yes, it is. <clears throat> so we could, if we do serial chemistry here, we could identify this as RNS, right? Mm -hmm. We could do that. But uh, we don't, I did not show stereochemistry, so okay. therefore you're off the hook. Okay. <clears throat> All right. No, we don't need to say that this is cis because it's in a ring. It's always going to be cis, isn't it? That's not exactly uh, the case. If you make a 12 member ring with a double bond, it is possible to have a trans double bond in it. But that is a very, very strange case. So because it's always going to be cis, you, you don't have to indicate the stereochemistry. Yeah. Um, the first example that you showed us with um, the two ethyl-1 pentene mm -hmm. in the sawhorse, why do we need to identify that carbon-carbon double bond as one? Well, because it could be down there in the middle of the chain. Right, but it couldn't be because that's always going to be your first carbon. So well, you always should give it the lowest number. Right, so then based on what you said here, could we not assume the that the first cycle alkene is always one and two? Okay. Uh, an open chain alkene, you just give the double bond, the first carbon, the lowest number you can. Okay. All right, here we have a stop sign with a bunch of things hanging out and a double bond. Why don't you quickly go ahead and just figure out the numbering sequence and let's name it. Remember, carbons 1 and 2 must be the carbons of the double bond. And we want to go either clockwise or counterclockwise so that we get the lowest number sequence at the first point of difference. If we let this little guy down here be carbon 1, then that would be 2, 3, our first methyl group here would be in carbon 4. Okay? If we let this guy be carbon 1, we would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We have two methyl groups in carbon 5. Four is a lower number than five, isn't it? Therefore, we're going to number it this way. This gives us a four, six, six, as opposed to a five, five, seven. All right, go ahead and put the name together. 
it's a cyclooptene, isn't it? We have methyl groups in carbons 4, 6, and 6. Cyclooctene is our parent. Our methyl groups are 4, 6, 6, and we have 3 of them. Yeah? Um, what if you have a ethyl group uh, on the carbon 6 instead of for the uh, Well, Which it would be a 4-ethyl, 6, 6, dimethyl. Remember, um, <clears throat> you always shoot for the lowest number sequence. Once you decide on the numbering, then you arrange the, the okay. substituents alphabetically. All right, well, this is fun. Um, I hope that you now visit the uh, little tutorial that I showed you and um, practice some of these things because uh, the ones on the tutorial are actually very representative of the kinds of things that you would see on exams or quizzes. <clears throat> One more. Step one, do your numbering sequence. This is going to be a cyclohexadiene, isn't it? Everybody looks at this and they really dearly want to make this carbon number one because it has a methyl group on it. But that's not good, is it? Because if that was one, that would have to be two. And then our next double bond would be three, four, five. We're not going to number it that way. If this was carbon one, this would have to be two. And our next double bond would be up here at 5. Therefore, we want to give the double bonds the lowest possible numbers. So, that isn't going to be 1. This is. Now our double bonds are 1, 3. As opposed to 1, 5. Now, <clears throat> only thing we have to say here is that we have a cyclohexadiene and we have a methyl group in carbon 2. Our parent is cyclohexadiene. The double bonds are 1 and 3. 1, 3, cyclohexadiene. And carbon 2 has a methyl. If we had numbered it the other way, we would have 1-methyl, 1,5-cyclohexadiene, and that's wrong. 1,3 is better than 1,5. So practice these. Go to the tutorial and practice them. Now, like I say, I wrote this, um, and the, uh, the coding in there is a little bit uh, tricky at times. Um, I think it works. If you find something that doesn't work, please let me know, okay? So I can go in and try to figure out what's wrong. <clears throat> well, there's one more thing that we need to talk about in terms of alkenes. Remember the stereochemistry thing. We said that we can look at our carbon chain, decide if it was on opposite sides, or on the same side. Opposite sides, we call it twin. Same side, we would call it cis. Everybody's happy with that, right? All right, so if we had this compound, this would be what? It's a 1, 2, 3, 4, so it's a butte. It's a butene, and the double bond is on carbon 2. The stereochemistry here would be trans, right? Trans to butene. 
Everybody's happy with that, right? All right. Go ahead and name this one. Is this guy cis or is it trans? Obviously, we have to tell because if the bromine was up top and chlorine down, that would be a different isomer, wouldn't it? Cis and trans isn't going to cut it. Cis and trans is fine if you're dealing with very simple alkenes, but we need a better way. Now, this means learning an entire new set of rules. Except, this is organic chemistry. We don't like rules, right? So, we're going to use a rule that we already know. Remember, the Kahn Engel prelude rules that we use for RNS, we're going to use those all over again. Except instead of RNS, we're going to call them E and C. All right? So we learned these rules. We had to live through them. We can do RNS. Now we're going to use the same set of rules and make it E and C. Just like before, we're going to rank according to atomic number. Now we're ranking the atoms that are attached to our double bond. Once we've done a ranking, we look to see on each carbon if the highest priority group is on the same side, we will call it Z. If it's on the opposite side, we will call it E. Now this is the only place that is, this is mean, you would like to think that Z would be the same as trans, because Z looks like trans, right? And then E, all these little things are coming out on the same side. That should be cis, but it's actually for the German. Susamen, same side, uh, intagen, opposite sides. So we have to apologize for that, but the concept is very simple. Just like we did with RNS, if we have a tie, we just go out the chain until we hit a tiebreaker. Just like in RNS, if we have multiple bonds, it's multiple of that atom. All right? So we get to use these rules all over again. Let's look at this guy. Is this guy going to be? Well, we can't use cis and trans. Is this going to be E or Z? Step one, we have to find our periodic table and come up with atomic numbers. Hydrogen is one. Carbon is six. Bromine is 35. Now we go to each carbon of the alkene. We look to see which is the highest priority on each carbon. So on the first carbon here, this guy, carbon is going to be the highest priority, biggest atomic number. On our second carbon of the alkene, we have carbon and bromine. Bromine wins. Therefore, the geometry looks like this. The two highest priority groups are on the same side. Therefore, this is Z stereochemistry. We would name it like this. We will put our Z in parentheses. Followed by a dash, no spaces, and then we simply name the alkene. Naming our alkene, this is going to be a 2-bromo-butene. 
we must say this is a two-butene to indicate double bond is here and not somewhere else. Z, two bromo, two butene. Let's go back and do the one that started all the trouble. Quickly, come up with a name for this fellow. Atomic numbers, hydrogen is 1, carbon is 6, bromine is 35, and chlorine over here is 17. Now you look at each carbon, you decide which is the highest priority. First carbon here, this is going to be the methyl group. The second carbon, 35 is bigger than 17, therefore we have same size stereochemistry. And we remember that same side is spelled with a Z. Go ahead and write the name. Our parent here has three carbons, doesn't it? One, two, three. So it's going to be a propene. Attached to carbon number one, we have a bromine and a chlorine. Therefore, it's going to be a one bromo, one chloro, and our stereochemistry is Z. Yeah? Say if the bromine was just another uh, methyl or something, and you had a chloral methyl with the EUZ. Yeah, if this was a methyl group, then chlorine would be the highest priority, and it would be E stereochemistry, and it would be a 1, 2, 3, 4, a few T. Speaking of, let's look at this guy. Here's a diene, isn't it? If we simply put in our atomic numbers, hydrogen is 1, carbon is 6, we have hydrogen, carbon, and here we have carbon and carbon. <clears throat> On our first carbon here, <clears throat> the methyl group is going to be highest priority. But out here we have a tie, don't we? Because it's a carbon on both cases attached to the double bond. So we do our tiebreaker. We ask what is this carbon attached to and what is this guy? This guy is in a double bond. This guy is only three hydrogens. Double bond counts twice, so we have one hydrogen and two carbons. So just to uh it's not actually a, um, I, I know you use the same configuration as if it would be a chiral center, but it's not really a chiral center. Oh, it's not a chiral center? Yeah. No. It's just uh, we're, we're using the doing, same system. Uh -huh. Same side, opposite side. So, here we have two carbons, here we have only hydrogens. This is the highest priority. Therefore, our highest priority link looks like that. There are opposite sides of the double bond. We remember that opposite is spelled with an E. 
Now, naming this thing, where do we want carbon-1 to be? Carbon-1 is going to be out here, so we can give our double bonds the lowest number. So this is going to be carbon-1. It's a diene. It's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so it's a pentadiene, right? And the double bonds are in carbons 1 and 3. We also have a methyl group dangling off in carbon number 3. It's a 1,3 pentadiene down here in carbon 3. We have a methyl group. And our stereochemistry <coughs> is E. So this is just like we did with RNS, isn't it? Same tiebreakers and everything. We just spell it differently. E and C. Let's do another one. Very quickly, assign your priorities around our double bond. We have a carbon and a hydrogen. Here we have a carbon and a carbon. And the methyl group is going to be the highest priority here. On this side, we need a tiebreaker. So we look and see what's attached to each of these carbons. Here we have two hydrogens and an oxygen. Up here we have a hydrogen and two carbons. So which is going to be the highest priority group? You know this, we did it with RNS. Doesn't matter that there's two carbons. Oxygen has a higher atomic number, doesn't it? Therefore, this is the highest priority group. And we have Z stereochemistry. Now, we don't know how to name alcohols yet. <coughs> um, if we did, we would call this Z, 2 isopropyl, 2 butene, 1 all. But we'll do that in chapter 17. Any questions? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, it is. It is a pentene one all. Sorry. Thank you. This is a two pentene one all. Sorry. All right. Very quickly. <clears throat> Look at these guys and give them acceptable names. Our first one <coughs> is a simple 
cyclohexane, isn't it? Carbons 1 and 2 must be in our double bond. <clears throat> we want this guy to be carbon 1. If we make it be carbon 1, it gives us a 1-methyl, doesn't it? We also have a methyl group out here at carbon number 3. Because it's a cycloalkene, we don't need to do um, cis and trans or E and Z. So we could simply name this 1,3-dimethyl cyclohexane. There is one step more we could do here, however, right? Is this a chiral center? Yeah, it is. It is. Can you quickly in your head tell me what the stereochemistry is? Highest priority is going to be the double bond, then the CH2, then the methyl. If you looked at this from the bottom, so hydrogen is going away from you, I believe it is S stereochemistry. So the proper name would be um, 3S 1,3-dimethyl cyclohexane. Go ahead and do the next one. We have a simple alkene, don't we? We want to give it the lowest possible number, which means we want to start numbering at this end of the molecule. <clears throat> Our double bond is going to be in carbon number three. Our longest chain is going to be eight carbons from down here. In carbon seven, we're going to have a chlorine. What's the stereochemistry here? Well, on carbon 3, we have a hydrogen and a carbon. So carbon 2 is the highest priority group there, right? Here we have a methyl group and a CH2 that's attached to another carbon. So this is going to be the highest priority group. And our stereochemistry looks like that. It's on the same side, and we spell that with a Z. <clears throat> Finally, our name is going to be eight carbons, so it's an octene. Double bond is in carbon three. We have a methyl in carbon four, and a chlorine in carbon seven. Z, Cyclohexene with way too many methyl groups and an ethyl. Decide which carbon you want to be number one. <clears throat> Decide on a number sequence. This carbon up here be carbon number one. The first number in our name would be a 1-methyl, wouldn't it? If we let this carbon be carbon one, the first number in our name would have to be a 2-methyl. Therefore, this guy must be carbon one, 
and his friend here is Carmen too. But remember, Carmen's one and two must be this. Yeah. In our name, the first number that you're going to generate from this sequence is one methyl. If we started here, our first one would be two. And one is less than two. All right, put the name together. We have methyl groups in carbons 5, 5, and 6. We have an ethyl group, or and 1, and we have an ethyl group in carbon 3. It is a cyclohexene. 3 ethyl, 1, 5, 5, 6, tetramethyl cyclohexene. have a cyclooctadiene, don't we? Eight carbons, two double bonds. Carbons one and two must be double bond carbons. We're looking for the lowest number we can get. That means we want this guy to be one. That's going to give us one apple. Go ahead and write the name. One ethyl, one five, cyclooctadiene. Double bonds at carbons one and five. Ethyl group at carbon one. Two more, and then we'll quit. Quit this anyway. Very simple carbon here. Our parent is going to have one, two, three, four carbons, so it's a two butene, isn't it? We're going to let the CH2Cl be carbon number one. <clears throat> because this will give us a 1,3 dichloral. If we started out here, it would be a 2,4 dichloral. How about the stereochemistry? It says E or Z. We have the chlorine is the winner down here. High with the carbons. This guy has a chlorine on it. They are on the same side. And we spell same side with a C. Z, 1, 3, dichloro, 2 methyl, 2 butene. And our last one here. <clears throat> a little unhappy ring here with a double bond in it. This is a cyclopropene. Carbons 1 and 2 must be the carbons of our double bond. 
<clears throat> we want to come up with the lowest number sequence, so we let this be carbon 1. We also recognize that we have a chiral center here, don't we? Why don't you write a name and put in R or S for this center? It's going to be a dimethyl cyclopropene, isn't it? No carbons 1 and 2 are a double bond. So it's a 1,3-dimethyl cyclopropene. If we looked at this guy, hydrogen is kind of pointing down. So I pretend that I'm standing above it. This would be carbon 1, because it has a methyl group. This would be carbon 2, and the methyl group would be carbon 3. So it looks to me like it's going to go this way, and that's an R, isn't it? I didn't put the R in, but this is R, in parentheses, 1,3-dimethyl cyclopropene. <clears throat> you can have R and C in the name? Yeah, you can. You have to indicate, um, uh, I would put in the number for the stereochemistry. Uh, here you don't have to. Um, we had a longer chain. All right. Again, more practice. <clears throat> On your Blackboard site, I don't know if any of you have been here, but there's a link for Organic Interactive. Okay? If you click on this, it will take you to actually a very old page that I did. Um, here we have the old Organic Chemistry Online. Um, the newer Organic Interactive is up here. If you click on that, it takes you to a McMurray site. And this is Organic Interactive that I wrote with John McMurray. You simply choose a chapter. Here I chose chapter 6. Click on Organic Interactive, you'll get something like this. Um, these are not algorithmic. In those days, we couldn't do that. Um, now we do. But there are like, oh, there's nine problems here for calculating degrees of unsaturation. Um, there are also, let's see, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, things here for alkenes, reactions, nomenclature, whatever. It's just a nice, simple way to review. Um, I'm not sure that Brooks Cole realized that this site is still up and it's free, but it's there, and this is how you can get to it. Any questions? All right, enough of the nomenclature stuff. Let's go ahead and do some chemistry. In chapter 6, we talked about this reaction. We said that if you take an alkene and react it with a halogen acid, when we say halogen acid, we mean HBr, HCl, uh, HI, HF doesn't do it, um, that you will add the elements of HBr to the double bond, and we will wind up with a bromoalkane. In chapter 6, we said that this reaction proceeded because we have a strong acid, and our electron cloud here in the pi system is a really good Lewis base. That's electron donor. We said the first step is going to be simply putting this proton on this nice little red spot, because that's where the electrons are. There's a double bond. 
There's our pi system. Step one, we said we were going to add to that. Now, this is an intermediate that you usually don't show, but it does make understanding the thing a bit easier. The second step in this is going to be rearrangement of the pi complex into a sigma complex. So essentially what happens is this hydrogen is going to slide either to this carbon or to this one and form the bond. The process can be described as this. If the hydrogen slides this way, over here, so it slides down to this carbon, we wind up with a methyl group. This is now a carbocation. If it slides the other way, slides down here, we wind up with a CH2, CH3, and another carbocation. Now the energetics of this are such that we want to form the most stable carbocation. This primary carbocation is not formed. The only one that you get is the secondary carbocation, and this is the one that then goes on to give products. So the bottom line here is that we're going to add our proton to the carbon of the alkene that's going to give us the most stable carbocation. Well, we're going to do carbocation stability in just a second. This is the fact. Let's just deal with the facts first, and then we'll explain why in a minute. This is what's referred to as Markonikov's rule. Markonikov's rule actually says, in the addition of HBr, the hydrogen, <coughs> or the carbon is supposed to be, bearing the greatest number of hydrogens, um, we'll get the hydrogen. So this has two hydrogens, this has one. Markonikov says the hydrogen goes here, boom. Problem with Markonikov's rule is that it's full of holes. Um, and it's so much better, so much simpler, if you simply remember the most stable carbocation is always formed. This carbon has the greatest number of hydrogens, but this is unequivocally the most stable carbocation. All right, so the theoretical explanation of why Markonikov rule works is that we want to form the most stable carbocation. We need to talk a little bit about carbocations. Carbocation, the carbon has three things attached to it and a positive charge. Because it has three things attached to it, it will be planar and trigonal. Now, it still has its p orbital. It's still there, but there's nothing in it. It's just empty. So this is what it looks like. Again, this is trigonal. Here's that carbon. It's trigonal and we have our empty p orbital up and down. When you look at carbocations, the way you want to rank stability first is just to look to see whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary. A very simple ordering. Oh, by the way, this is 120 degrees, again, trigonal planar. The simple ordering, <coughs> tertiary is going to be the most stable, secondary, then primary, then the four little metal Most stable to least stable. This is for simple alkyl car carbocations. <coughs> because <clears throat> the carbocation here is trigonal planar. 
the carbocation itself, in order to be stable, must also be planar. Classic example, here's our bicyclic compound. What if we put a positive charge on this carbon? Well, the way I've got it drawn here, you could pretend that that's planar, couldn't you? But that's really not the way it is. This is a boat cyclohexane. So really, here's our boat. This is what we're talking about. This is not planar. And because it's not planar, it's very unstable. Less stable than that. So, first thing you do for simple carbocations, ions, you make sure it's planar. And then you simply see, is it tertiary, secondary, primary, or methyl? Tertiary is more stable. Methyl is the least. Now, we can demonstrate this by calculating electrostatic potential maps for the different carbocations. There's a tertiary, a secondary, and a primary. Remember an electrostatic potential map. The ability to support a positive charge is shown in blue. Electron excess is red. Here with our primary, we see a huge blue carbon. Secondary, it's much less. Tertiary, it's just kind of sky blue. Basically, alkyl groups release electrons. They release electrons inductively. So what happens is each of these methyl groups here will move some of their electron density in towards a positive carbon. That means the more methyl groups you have attached, or alkyl groups in general, the more electrons are shoveled in there and the smaller the charge. One methyl group, big charge, two, in between, three, teeny tiny. So that's why tertiary is better because of the inductive electron releasing of the alkyls. All right, next, when you're evaluating carbocations, you want to see if the carbocation is obviously primary, secondary, or tertiary, then you want to see, is it resonance stabilized? Examples of resonance stabilized carbocations. If we have a carbocation that's adjacent to an oxygen, we can do a resonance form where we move these electrons in to form an oxygen-carbon double bond. When we do that, we have put our positive charge now on the oxygen. Oxygen does much better with positive charges than does carbon. Think about H3O+. All familiar with that guy. Oxygen does a better job than carbon. Here we have a halogen. Again, we have an unshared pair. We can move it in and we get the halonium ion. Nitrogen, even better than oxygen, move this electron pair in, and we get an ammonium ion. So if we have electrons that are adjacent to our carbocation, we can stabilize that. All of these will be much, much, much more stable than even a tertiary. One more example of resonance stabilized. This is our benzyl carbocation. Now you would look at this and say, well, this poor guy is a primary, isn't it? That's not good. Think about it, though. What can we do with this guy? We have this benzene ring next to it. We can take and move electrons from the ring out here 
now we have taken our positive charge off of this carbon and placed it in our ring by resonance. With benzyl, we can do this again. We can move these electrons over and put our positive charge out here. Finally, we can do it one more time and put the positive charge here. If we move the electrons up from the CH2, we're back where we started. So in the benzyl carbyl cation, we have spread the positive charge out over four different carbons. So spreading it out is good. <clears throat> this makes it, uh, again, much more stable than even the tertiary. So step one, we are evaluating carbon cation. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Step two, you look to say, wait a minute. Is it resonance stabilized? Because resonance is always going to win. That's where Markonikov's rule falls down, <clears throat> because you would predict certain additions based on his rule, but if it's resonance stabilized, like for the benzyl group, he's wrong. So always do most stable carbocations. Any questions on carbocations? Then? Let's go back then to our basic mechanism. In our basic mechanism, we said we were going to take our alkene, we're going to add HBr, and we're going to form a bromoalkane. We know that this is a stepwise process, right? Step one, we don't write it, but we know we're going to put a pi cloud. Step two, we're going to uh, collapse the protonated pi system, and we're going to form the most stable carbocation. Here, this is going to be the secondary. Remember, in order to get there on our reaction coordinate, we go up in energy through our uh, highest energy transition state. And then we go down to our intermediate. The second step of the process, halogen is now going to attack this. When it does, it attacks the positive center, negative ion, positive ion. And we go down to give our final product. This is a fast step, a little bit of energy. This is a slow step, lots of energy. Any questions? Let's look at a movie. Everyone likes movies. <clears throat> Addition of HBr to ethene. Now, this isn't going to show the protonated pi intermediate. <clears throat> it's simply going to add a proton to our double bond to form the carbocation. Here it's a primary carbocation. In the fast step, bromide anion attacks to give product. Let's see if this works. Step one. <clears throat> this accepts the proton to give the carbocation. Step two. Bromide could attack from either the top or the bottom. And it does, we get our final product, the bromo ethene. Any questions? <clears throat> this is a uh, movie that we did for Mike Murray's book years ago. All right, go ahead, give me the product for this addition. Mm -hmm. 
quite often on an exam, <coughs> I will make this a um, two question question. Question number one, there'll be a little box here. I'll say draw the structure of the most stable carbon cation. Box number two, draw the structure of the final product. So let's address it this way. We know we're going to protonate this. We can do it two ways, <coughs> one to each carbon. If we put the hydrogen down here, we would get this. If we put the hydrogen up here, we would get <coughs> this. We look at them and say, this is tertiary, this is secondary. Who wins? Tertiary does. So our most stable carbon cation is going to be this guy. Our second step in the reaction, we're going to take and add bromide anion to the carbocation. When we do that, bromide will simply attack here, and we will wind up with the one bromo, one methyl cyclohexane. Now that's fun, isn't it? Step one, you look to see what carbocations you can form. You choose the most stable one and simply add halogen. Let's do it again. Draw the most stable carbocation with this addition. And then draw me the final product. proton to either of the two carbons. Which one does Markonikov choose? <laughs> By his rule. Have one hydrogen here, we have none there. So we would get the hydrogen, but we go here according to Markonikov, right? So we have two possible carbocations we could form. This guy is what Markonikov predicts. <coughs> this is a tertiary carbocation. I guess it's not. Oh, up here, we have a tertiary carbocation, right? What do we have here, though? This is a carbon adjacent to our benzene ring. That makes it a benzyl carbocation. And what did we just say about benzyl? They are resonance stabilized, aren't they? So who is the most stable? Not the tertiary, but in fact, the <coughs> All right, so our most stable carbocation then we show simply as the benzyl carbocation. <coughs> now, we take and we add bromide anion to our positive carbon. Our product is the alpha bromo substituted thing. We don't know how to name that yet. <clears throat> That's chapter 14, I think. This is an example of where we get the anti marconikov Product. It is opposite to what is predicted by the rule. However, 
If your rule simply is you form the most stable copper cation, this is what you get. Now on your exam for this type of material, like I've been hinting at, you can expect problems like this, where you draw the most stable carbocations and the final product. The other type of problem that you're going to get are reactions. When you see your second exam, you will have two full pages, each with 12 reactions in a row. So let's just do some reactions. <coughs> All you have to do here, you don't have to show an intermediate, you just have to show the final product. You look at it, you say, we have an alkene, we're reacting with HBr, we're going to make a bromoalkane, aren't we? All we have to do is decide where the bromine is going to go. It will go to the carbon that forms the most stable carbon anion, right? We have a primary carbon and we have a tertiary carbon. Which one is going to be the carbon anion? Tertiary is more stable than primary, therefore bromide anion will add here. Here's the next one. Here we're going to form a chloroalkane, aren't we? The chlorine will be attached to the carbon that gave the most stable carbocation. What are our two possibilities? <clears throat> this would give us a primary. This would give us a secondary. Secondary is more stable than primary. Therefore, the chlorine goes here. Our next one, we're also going to form a bromoalkane, aren't we? This stuff here, benzene ring with a double bond attached like that, that's styrene. You've all heard of polystyrene, right? Okay, well this is styrene before you make a polymer from it. We have two possibilities here. This would give us a primary carbocation, right? This one would be what? It's next to a benzene ring, so it's benzylic. Benzylic, next to a benzene ring, very stable. The chlorine goes, or bromine goes here. There's our most stable benzyl carbocation. And the bromine simply adds here. How about this guy? Actually, let's back up here. 
<clears throat> this one here, is this a chiral center? This carbon right here, is that chiral? What's attached to it? Benzene ring, hydrogen, bromine, methyl. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. So will our product be RRS? Well, it will be both, won't it? Why? Carbocation, go back here. Carbocation is planar, right? That means bromine could attack from the top, and it would give us R, or it could attack from the bottom and give us S. Equal probability, so we wind up with a racemic mixture, 50-50. How would you mean it according to state of mixture? No, we, you wouldn't. <coughs> you just, yep, it would just be, <coughs> well, this is alpha methyl benzene bromide. But that's what you would name it. All right, so let's do this again. Here we have <coughs> a cyclopentene with a methyl group and a chlorine. Decide which one of these is going to give, which one of these two carbons will give the most stable carbocation. Well, if this was simply um, a problem on the exam, this is the product you would write. Now working backwards, you could say, therefore, this carbon here gave the most stable carbocation. Let's make sure we understand why. This carbon is adjacent to a chlorine. This is tertiary. If we had this as our carbocation, this is resonance stabilized, isn't it? That is, we can take the electrons from our chlorine here, move them in, and make the chloronium ion. Resonance always wins. Therefore, this is the most stable carbon cation, and therefore, this is our product. Any questions on that? So if you have a resonance form, it doesn't matter if it's secondary to the sugar. Right. <clears throat> this is resonance stabilized. This is not. Resonance wins. Now let's go one step further. We have made a chiral center here, haven't we? We make it because the bromide can attack from the top or from the bottom, just like we said before. If it attacks from the top, <clears throat> we would get this product, bromide up, chlorine down, right? If it attacks from the bottom, we would get bromine down, chlorine up. Now, when we did the benzyl group, we said we would get a racemic mixture, didn't we? Again, there's, well, you would think that up and down would be uh, equal probability. <clears throat> if we were to um, name this, we would name it as an E. This one's a Z the bromine's highest. But in fact, unlike the benzyl, <coughs> this guy, it's a major product, is this one. This is minor. Why is that? Because bromine's big, and so is the methyl. So the pathway to getting here, coming in the top, is not as crowded 
coming in the bottom, you have to scooch by this methyl group. So this is actually the major product. Any questions? Um, Lots of subtleties in organic chemistry. Yeah. So why are you using E and Z there instead of R and S? Uh, you're right. I should have. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. it should be our right. Okay. I have to change that slide. Okay. I was hoping you wouldn't notice, so I'll change it like that. Okay. All right. That does Chapter 7. Uh, again, just a warning. Chapter 8, we've done one reaction here in Chapter 7. One. Chapter 8, we're going to do 14 of them. Okay. Chapter 9, we will do 14 more. So, this is where organic chemistry gets interesting. We're going to approach all of these, however, from the same mechanistic view, <clears throat> trying to predict the products based on carbocation stability and stuff like that. Hopefully, it'll come together, even though there's a lot, it'll come together, but <clears throat> make sure that you prepare yourself for class so you're not blasted. On Thursday, we will